Hey everybody, it's Nick here again for Grayscale Gorilla. I am the gorilla and today we are going to do a tutorial that I have been uh, planning to do and trying to figure out here for quite a while. I think uh, I finally figured some stuff out and I'm excited to do this one. I really am. Um, it is the uh, rebranding tutorial for the um, uh, for the discovery package that it, that was done uh, maybe around Christmas or so, Discovery Channel did a new rebranding package with all these fun cube things. And uh, We Are Royal is the place that um, that's the site called. Uh, it's a shop called Royal, and they did um, they did this uh, package. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, I want to figure out how to do that. And uh, so I hopped into cinema, tried to figure it out, and um, it was a little trickier than I thought. It was a little trickier than I thought. So, uh, you know, I kind of played with it a little bit uh, here and there, and it wasn't until there was a thread on MoGraph.net, which uh, if you haven't been to, uh, please check that out. Uh, I'll link all this below, um, so all these things I'm talking about. So uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was kind of a forum post on MoGraph.net about how to do how to pull this trick off and a lot of people had some ideas none of them were quite working so I decided to hop back into cinema and just keep playing until I figured it out and I think I got a pretty decent solution um, a couple things before we get started first of all check out the original which we're gonna watch right now actually uh, from Royal uh, give them a high five and a props for uh, making this thing it's, I think it's really cool solution uh, for the for the network um, also check out MoGraph.net where uh, a lot of other people are trying to figure out this trick um, and also I wanted to give you guys a heads up that there's a tutorial in Russian of a guy uh, I think it's Russian or uh, I forgot actually I think it's Russian actually uh, or or German not sure now uh, of a guy doing this tutorial uh, and uh, it came to my attention actually after I uh, figured out how to do it and he has a he has a couple things he does that are uh, a little bit similar actually he's got a pretty good uh, he's got a pretty good way to do it and the reason I wanted to steer you over there was um, not to watch a, uh, a, a tutorial that you may not understand it's just to show that um, there's no right way to do this stuff. In fact, um, I don't know how the original was done. Uh, I'm assuming it's a little more complicated than what we're going to get into, uh, just uh, just because they have uh, a lot of varied looks and stuff like that. So uh, I just wanted to show you that, just to show you that there's other ways to do these things. It's not my way or the highway. It's not the right way or the wrong way. Whatever gets it done, man. Whatever makes it look right. So uh, check out uh, check out his as well. Um, anyway, let's get into it. Enough talking, enough of my face. I'm excited to show you guys. I think this is going to be a pretty big tutorial. Uh, it's, we're going to get a little, um, maybe not technical, but I'm going to go uh, into a lot of explaining on this one, on uh, kind of decisions and why they're being made and, uh, you know, showing you why I'm making decisions. And again, not just button pushing. Anybody can put a, up a tutorial that uh, t shows you what, which buttons to hit. And of course, yours is going to look just like the tutorial because you're going to hit all the buttons. Not here, folks. I'm going to tell you why I'm making all the decisions uh, and why I'm uh, using certain plugins and this and that. And in fact, if I don't explain myself clearly enough, I would love for you guys to uh, let me know. So uh, I'm about done uh, doing my talk thing. Let's just shut up and, and, and do this. Here is uh, the site. Here's We Are Royal. Uh, check them out. Turn that down. Uh, check them out. Check out the original here. And let's just kind of watch it and talk about what's going on here. You can see they have a lot of photographic elements. They have these cube kind of things spinning around. Um, and uh, they're revealing different photos. You can see also the cubes rotate in different directions. Um, you know, they have a lot of fun things going on. Very, you know, very simple technique, but but also varied. This one's kind of more quiet. You see, this one's more like elegant. Some of them are more aggressive for different shows. Um, but the main thing to look uh, look at here is the quality of the shadowing and kind of what's going on there. And another thing to notice before we get started is. It may at first look like the photos are attached to the cube as they flip around, but if you look closely, you're going to notice that they're not actually. The cubes are just masking on and off photos. In other words, there's not a projection going on and, and textures sticking the cubes. 
it looks like it's just kind of revealing a photo underneath. And this is one of the things that made me um, realize that I think we're gonna do all the photo stuff in After Effects. Uh, because we don't need to project these textures and images directly onto the cubes, and we're just revealing it, I think we're gonna actually do all the photographic work and all the revealing in After Effects, and only take care of the cube part in um, in cinema. So using this, actually this still will kind of uh, show show us what we're gonna build. We're gonna build a, uh, a version of the cubes here flipping around, and what we wanna do is have, them, have the ability to bring these cubes into After Effects once we have it rendered, and then use After Effects to choose our photos, to position our photos, and then use the 3D mats to reveal the photos. So anyway, that's our plan. Um, so let's head into, into Cinema and talk about how we're gonna pull this off. All right, I'm excited. Finally, no, no more uh, talking. We're in Cinema and we're just gonna, we're just gonna rock this thing. Um, uh, first thing we need obviously is a cube. Uh, and here's the way we're gonna pull this thing off. There's uh, uh, basically four sides of this cube if you look at it this way. There's it's kind of as it flips, you know, if we just ignore the top and the bottom, we're gonna kind of flip around. And the way I see it is, if you if we go back and look at a lot of these animations, and you could check it out too, most of the moves are not just 90 degrees. It's not just a cube flipping 90 degrees. It's flipping all the way around to the back. So you can see um, this one, see there's a lot of 180 moves, right? And that's kind of how we want to approach this. So here's here's my thinking. We see the front of the cube. We, we kind of figure out how we can randomly flip around to the back of the cube, which is here. And then we're going to flip back around to the front and reveal basically three different photos. All right. So let's build this thing up. In MoGraph, I'm going to build a cloner object. I'm going to add the cube to it. Uh, and I'm going to use the cloner object with a grid array to build our wall. Because we're essentially just building a wall of cubes here that we're eventually going to kind of flip around. Um, so we don't we do need kind of three by three this way, but we don't need a Z depth. We don't need three deep. So we're gonna get rid of the Z here. We're just gonna say one deep. Got it? And then uh from there, we're actually gonna shrink the cube before we get this. This will help with our math as well. I'm gonna make the cube a hundred by a hundred by a hundred. And I think that's gonna help us out a bit. Um so here is our three by three grid wall. And what we need to do is make this kind of add more cubes, right? So instead of three by three, we're gonna actually make this um, kind of like 16 by nine. And the reason I'm doing that is just purely because I'm being lazy about it and I know that if I make the cube 16 by nine, that the ratio is gonna be 16 by nine and that uh, HD video will fit in it and fo and we can export an HD uh, scene that is 16 by 9 ratio. That's basically the only kind of reason we did that. Um, uh, so in that case, what we're going to do is we're just going to up our size until the edges of our cubes just barely touch. And if we kind of get close, you're going to see we're getting closer here. Uh, you're going to see that right around 1500, the math works out that 1500 is the exact number. If we hit render, we're going to get an absolutely clean plate here. They're not, they're just barely touching right on the edge, right? That's what we want. Uh, and the same actually works with the nine. So we can go 800 tall and know that if we just take 100 away, that we're going to get an exact kind of copy of this thing right there. So that's it. That's our uh, main. That's our main kind of uh, uh, wall right here. Now, um, the first thing, let me walk you through kind of the concepts of, of some of the things that I tried and also some of the things that didn't work and why they didn't work. My first inclination, if you've played around with a cloner object and MoGraph and stuff like that, was to use a random effector. And let's just grab the random effector and I'll show you why the random effector didn't work. Uh, first of all, we don't want the position. We don't want scale. We want rotation. And we want rotation to be like, you know, like this. And you can see there's a couple things wrong with um, with the random effector. One is we can't control which direction they're spinning uh, because it's random, right? 
We also can't control uh, them resting on a on a plain point because what we what we want is a flat area, right? So everything's flat here, and then we want them to randomize. They want we want them to kind of flip randomly, but then we want them to flatten out again. And 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 this random effector really kind of doesn't allow us to clamp uh, the top. There are some ways to kind of maybe cheat that, but we still just don't have enough control. The problem with the random effector is we don't have control over our animation. It's random. It's exactly what it says. So this is why I kind of abandoned the random effector and why it took a while to figure out how to pull this off. Um, so here, let me show you what we ended up, you know, kind of figuring out. Shader effector is... Um, kind of a one I haven't used a lot. Let me actually add it to our uh, cloner object. And uh, the shader effector is something I really haven't played around with a lot. And I've only recently kind of played with it uh, based on uh, Mike uh, the Monkey. His uh, tutorial, if you go watch the NAB stuff that he did, uh, he talked a lot about using, uh, you know, uh, audio and stuff and he, he talked a little bit about using the shader effector and driving um, you know animation with with uh, with visuals that he built from audio so anyway I just kinda never played with it until I saw him use it and I've just been playing around with it a little bit and it just so happens that the shader effector is what we need to pull this off what the shader effector does is it looks at a texture so let's build a texture and let me show you let's we'll just talk a little bit about what we need I'm gonna shut off color and specular I'm only concerned about luminance and I'm gonna make a noisy texture and what noise allows us to do is noise allows us to be random right but it also allows us to control white and black and if we think about it that way the noise becomes the perfect way to be random in between things but then clamp at 100%. In other words, the random effector kind of just kept going on being random and random and random, and there's no way to clamp the top end of that randomness. With the shader effector, what we have are, are kind of numbers that, that limit at white. So you can see these numbers here, you know, we're limiting white at 256, essentially, um, and we're limiting zero at, at black at zero, right? So we essentially have all this range to play with and at black for example our cubes will be facing this way and at white for example our cubes will be facing the second way we need them which is 180 degrees so let's let me show you how to use the shader effector and a noise shader to give our cubes randomness but also um, a, a, a control them in a more um, kind of uh, linear way I guess is the way to say it so uh, let's let's do that uh, the first thing we need to do is tell the shader effector uh, we want to make sure the cloner object has the shader effector in there so that's good we also want to tell the shader effector not to affect scale but to affect rotation so uh, in this case we want the rotation to be 180 degrees this way right and the way the shader effector is going to look at it is it's going to apply this texture to our scene and then use the black and white points to rotate. So let's um, let me swap this sphere with uh, a plane just so we can get a better idea of what's going on here. And then let's apply our texture to the shader effector. And then now we have to tell tell the shader effector what which texture to look at. If we go to shading, we just look at uh, right, by default it says custom shader here. We actually want luminance. And as soon as we click luminance, look at that, dude. We have this noise shader um, kind of affecting our cubes. So now let's hop into the noise shader and, and see w kind of what we can use to animate this um, around. So you can see if we look at our noise, there's basically black and white, right? And if it's black it's gonna stay at zero degrees and if it's a hundred percent white the cube is gonna flip to 180 degrees so let's just control like something like brightness and you can see what's going on and in fact uh, the texture is also being applied to our scene so you can see there's white here and if we go all the way back uh, well it's gray but it, it's affecting our our scene based on how bright it is I'm actually gonna shut that off 
Um, let me see where we could shut that off. Shading, alpha, gray, use alpha, no. Well, we'll just leave it as is for now. Um, and let's just talk about what we animate to control these cubes. So if we turn up our brightness, you're gonna see it kind of, the noise takes over, and then as we go up, as we go up, it clamps at white, and then all of our layers are facing the, the, the correct direction. And what's tough now is we can't really tell which side of the cube we're looking at. And it's gonna be really hard to animate this thing and understand what we're seeing unless we kind of colorize our cube. So in fact, at this point, why don't we just go in and colorize our cube, which is gonna fix our white issue, and it's also going to fix our, um, like we don't know what side of the cube we're looking at here. So let's undo the cloner object just for now, or uncheck it, go in, and we're just gonna texture this cube uh, with different colors on each side so we can just know what the heck's going on. So let's do that. Um, we need to break apart our cube. First of all, we need to make it editable. And to do that, we hit C. Uh, and what we do now is we just need a way to split this cube into sections. We, what I actually want is a different kind of um, piece of geometry for each side of this cube. And uh, uh, this is the best way to pull this off is actually something that uh, Mike showed me as well. Um, and I'll link him up below. Um, he showed me that what you could do is you can select your polygons, right? And then on the cube, you can start to select polygons. I'm gonna, I'm gonna command A, which is I'm gonna select all the polygons. Then you come up here in the functions menu and you say disconnect. And then right here where it says preserve groups, you uncheck that, you hit okay, and then nothing freaking happens. Which to me is a little confusing, but what Mike explained is, he said, uh, you're essentially telling this cube to break up into separate sections. Um, you're not telling it to break it up in the actual menu, but kind of internally you're telling the cube that the, all these pieces are now disconnected. Now all we have to do is, with them all selected, go back into functions and say explode segments. And what we're doing here is we're now telling the cube, okay, we know you're all separate in there, but now we wanna see your separations. And so pull those separations out so we can manipulate them separately. What we have now is a, one layer for each side of the cube. And all we're concerned about are these four. One, two, three, and then four over here. And let's just start to texture those. So from now on, we can start to see what sides of the cube we're dealing with, okay? Uh, so let's pick the front face, um, which I may have passed. There it is, right? Yep. Let me make sure. I'm just going to grab it and move. Yep. Okay. So we have uh, face one. Okay. Then we're going to pick uh, the side, kind of right there. That's going to be face two. If we flip around to the back, we're going to get which I think that's face three. And then we flip all the way back around to this side and we want that one. That's face four. Everything else we don't care about, uh, the top and bottom or whatever. Now, all we have to do now is just make textures for each one of these. So let's just go ahead and color it, I don't know, blue. Okay, that one's blue. We'll make a new one. This one is uh, kind of, kind of whatever. Peach. Uh, new material. Uh, what? I'm gonna undo that. I'm just gonna copy and paste four materials total. Uh, this one's gonna be pink. I'm gonna add that to three. And it doesn't really matter at this point. We just need a visual reference of each of the different sides. So that's it. We have one, two, three, four different sides. Hopefully if we texture them, yep, top and bottom are gray. We're all fine. Now when we flip the cloner object back on, now what's cool is we can play with that shader effector we were just messing with. If we open that back up and we go into the noise properties, we can now see that we're, we're seeing different colors. And this is gonna help us animate and this is gonna help us understand what side the cube is facing. Because remember, what we need is a mat for each side of the cube to then reveal different photos, 
Okay, so uh, we'll, we're going to have a mat for the pink side. We're going to have a mat for the green side. And then as things flip around here, we're going to have a mat for the blue side and uh, also the fourth color, which is like kind of that peach color. So again, this is ugly. This is not part of the final render. This is just to know what the heck we're looking at right now. So really, this first move is all about animating this brightness from kind of negative to positive. That's our first move, essentially. And wish, I wish I could slide this and just show, but if I kind of go slowly, you can see that's our first move. Bam. Done. So let's set that animation up and just talk about it being the first move. Let's go to where um, the, pick, the, the pink starts to move. You can see we don't need to start from zero. We can kind of start you know, around here because it's still flat. We don't, and we don't want to keyframe kind of unwanted stuff. So we can start from right when we start to see some noise, just under that. Right there looks good. So let's go ahead and keyframe that. Let's say back here uh, at frame zero, we're gonna set a brightness keyframe uh, in our noise from uh, from frame zero. Bam. And then over the course of I don't know. Let's say over the course of 60, maybe three seconds. One, two, three. Yeah, that's that feels about right. Um, it's gonna go to all white, and all we have to find is the point where it gets to all white. Hit it, and that's it. Hit play. This is our first move. We're done. That's it. So it, what's nice is we have a sense of random, right? But we also have a um, a final resting place that is uh, forced, right? We're forcing it to end on 180 degrees, but it's getting there in a random way, which is nice. That's what this kind of shader effector was was doing that it was really helpful. So now that we're at second photo, right? We're at first photo here. We're going to go to second photo. Then what we're going to do is we're going to reverse back to the pink. We're basically going to do this in reverse, but back, right? And then in After Effects, we're actually going to replace this pink side with with a third photo. So if we if we if we think about it this way, we got first photo, da -da -da -da, second photo, ba -ba -da -ba, third photo, and then what we need is that little section uh, where they have like the text or the logo or the Discovery Channel logo or whatever. So what they end up doing is they usually show like two, three, or four photos, and then the last time they flip around, they kind of flip to this little tag area uh, and then this ends up being um, where the the logo or the tag or whatever is so we need to build that and the way I'm gonna do that is with a plane effector and a plane effector um, is let's just add it and let's talk about what the heck it does um, where am I missing it there it is plane effector basically there's kinda no tricks with the plane effector it's kind of you're telling the plane effector to do something and it doesn't. There's no, it doesn't look at anything. You just physically say, listen, you just need to do what I tell you. And in this case, we're gonna just force it to be, uh, to rotate around. So let, let's set that up. Let's in fact turn that off for now. I, I may have jumped the gun. Let's finish our shader effector animation and then we'll go to the plane effector, we'll do that end piece. So um, let's extend our timeline. I'm gonna make it like 250, just so we have enough room. Go to our noise. Go to our brightness, and from here, we need to, there's move one, right? And then from here, we need to go back to move two. Now, there's something I don't like about move one. I went too far, I went all the way to 100%, and this is gonna be boring if we leave it here, right? If everything is filled in and it's just a photo on the screen, it's gonna be kinda boring, and it's also not what they do here. They always have some extra cubes hanging out, that aren't 100% rotated, right? So we need to kind of emulate that with our luminance, with our noise. So instead, what we need to do is open up our timeline and go to that last keyframe, which was 60, remember? And instead of going to full white, we just need to leave a little bit of noise in there just so we have, when we hit render, we have a little bit of kind of randomness still hanging out. It doesn't need to be that much. Maybe a little more. That may be okay. So let's let's go ahead and hit that. And then what we want to do is animate that over time. So as we read this photo, it's maybe complete completing a little bit more. 
and it doesn't actually doesn't quite get a hundred percent there's still these couple little things here that uh, don't flip around what I don't I, what I don't like is that they're next to each other and all we have to do in this case is just kind of play with the scale a little bit of our of our um, noise and we're gonna get a slightly different result that's fine it's, it's kind of like get putting a different seed or something um, all right, so that I like a lot better, actually. So this is kind of our final resting area for the second um, part of the animation. I'm going to set a keyframe in the brightness. And then from here, then we're going to go back to our starting position. So in our timeline, I'm just going to kind of scale in and move our timeline down. And let's flip back to our first position. And we're going to do the same thing. We don't want to go to 100% pink, right? We want a couple cubes kind of still finishing up their move. Something like that. That seems right to me. So let's set another keyframe there. And then animate that over, over time to kind of a more but not quite completed rotation. That may even be too much right there. So let's look at the whole thing. <clears throat> let's let it play out. So scene one, scene two and then scene three, and then this is where we're gonna add that plane effector to do that last random piece. Now, um, a couple things to keep in mind is your animation may not be doing exactly what you thought it would, would when you set it. So I'm gonna go in and show you why that may be the case. Um, what, what, what Cinema does, similar to what After Effects does, is it tries to help you um, it tries to help you kind of set up your animations. And what happens is sometimes it does too much um, guessing and it screws up your animation. So this is, a good, this is a good place to see it. What we wanted was the animation to go from negative whatever right here, negative 79, ramp up, and then at 60, we want it to be at 62, and then slowly, gradually go to 73 brightness. But you can see what Cinema did is round off this curve. And what happens is, is if we go to here, and we go look at our texture, you can actually see we're at 100%. In fact, we're, you know, um, uh, well, we're not quite at 100%. We're about 85, but we didn't want to go higher than 73. But you could see what Cinema did. Hopefully, you could see this. It's kind of a light color here, kind of a light blue. But what Cinema did was kind of round this curve out. And we don't want that actually. What we want is this to be kind of a linear move from here to here. So in other words, it goes to there and then it kind of creeps toward zero or 100 or whatever. And then it ticks back. So we just had to come in and fix that curve. So let's look at the move now from start, bam. Dun, dun, first move and then back. That's what we want. And in fact, when it goes back, it does the exact same thing. What we want it to do is come down to here and then creep down to there, right? But it's not. It's actually dipping below where we want it and then back. We don't want that to happen. So we just need to come in, tell Cinema, no, we don't want that. And you need to force things, you know? You don't always have to rely on what the program kind of gives you by default. Sometimes you got to go in there and arm wrestle and, and, and kind of force these curves. Um, so that's uh, that's where we are. That feels pretty good to me. Dun -dun. Nothing's at 100%. It all feels good. I'm actually going to extend this second one really long time because I think that final, that final animation there, that may be even be too fast of a move, so I'm gonna move that in. So I'm just adjusting my timing at this point, and I'm just looking at it and feeling it out. I'm kind of playing that music too in the back of my head, and I'm seeing, is it elegant enough? Is it smooth enough? Do, 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 second page, do, no, 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 bump, bump, back to third, do, no, 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 do, and then that's it, right? That's feeling good to me. Um, I'll, I'll try not to sing too much, sorry guys. Uh, one thing we could do to keep the playback a little quicker is to go render instances. And that's that's actually going to give us a, a cleaner render. It's just going to kind of animate faster for us. Do, 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 do. Okay, that's that's feeling good. Now let's add our plane. Uh, let's add our add our plane effector and add that one little kind of 
patch of uh, title here that we need to uh, take into consideration. So uh, we have our animation. We have pink past green, which is kind of a secondary photo that nobody's really going to see, but it's going to be there. Into the third photo, pa back past that green photo into a new pink photo and then we have one more color waiting here to to animate with this plane effector so the plane effector actually we want it to go back to this peach color which is negative 90 degrees right um, but we don't want everything to flip back we just want this area to flip back and in that case we use a fall off and if you haven't used fall offs in um, in MoGraph yet uh, you, you should start and let's start right now Let's grab a box fall off and look and see what the heck it does first of all. If we just extend this and open it up, you're seeing what's going on is um, the box is telling what clones you want to be affected. And this works with all of your effectors. This whole list of effectors has a fall off on it. And you could use these to kind of animate things across the screen, have things turn on and off and flip. And you can also see that they're turning on uh, kind of slowly it's not a sudden jump. They're rotating according to the fall off. And this fall off is what you can actually, um, you could scale this here. So hopefully you could see there's like a red box in the middle. And then there's like that outside box that's the main box. Uh, and this inside box is kind of the 100% fall off. And the outside is when it starts to fall off. And we're going to use that to our advantage to get some of these random dudes hanging out. See these random guys? Check this out. So what we can do is, first of all, scale this thing down. We don't need it that large. We just need enough room for a logo. And we just kind of have to place it. And now just by tilting it, check this out. Bam. Just by tilting it, what we're getting is this little area that we can then add our logo or our um, title or whatever we wanted to add right there. And I'm actually going to squish it down even more. And I'm also going to play with the fall off and really kind of uh, make a lot of randomness in that fall off. And what I want is just barely two lines right here of um, place to put our logo. And after that, the rest is fine. Okay, so you can see what's going on. Um, this cube right here, I need flat. And it's not the plane effector that's making that cube stick out. It's actually the shader effector. And in this case, again, what we're going to do is just hop into the noise. And we're going to play with the um, scale. And if I pick a new scale for the noise, we may find one where we get a, kind of a, a full flattened thing. And in fact, that's actually going to flatten out more as time goes on. And that may be a little bit better for us right there. So again, it's kind of like adjusting the seed. Actually, we could just adjust the seed. It does the same thing. And we're going to get a slightly different um, kind of effect. And I think that is what we're looking for right there. That looks pretty dang good to me. Um, so now let's animate that, right? Because we don't need, we don't want the plane effector on the whole time. It's going to be screwy. We only need it after things are starting to fall back from here. So maybe right around here, we're going to start that plane effector. So let's go in. Go to our parameter, uh, nope, sorry, go to our effector, and we're just going to adjust the strength. We're going to say start here and then keep going as we animate. Um, and the strength is just telling the plane effector how strong to be over time. At this point, we don't want any of it. We want zero. So let's set a keyframe right there, control click on that little dot there. And then as we flip around, then we're going to add more uh, plane effector so that it clicks into this kind of uh, uh, title sequence part. And uh, right now we're just kind of setting up the animation and we could time it um, later. So let's, let's watch it, bam, move. And then as it flips around, now see what it did right there? It's adding that extra layer of animation at the end of just the plane effector. In other words, the plane effector is kind of telling these cubes to say, no, don't stop at pink keep going 90 degrees until we get to that peach color ba -ba 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 boom boom right there and that's actually feeling pretty good timing wise and just sit here and watch it um you know sit and watch it and feel the timing it's going to be 
much better for us to get the timing right in 3D before we pull this in After Effects because if we have the timing right, then all we have to worry about in After Effects is just compositing the whole thing and dealing with uh, which photos to pick and making those look good. And then all this other stuff will kind of come into play. That's looking pretty good to me. Um, in fact, at this point, what I like to do sometimes is come into, um, oh, not that, uh, is come into your uh, render settings and just set up a quick kind of external um, render. And what, the first thing we need to do is make sure it's 16 by 9. I'm going to lock the ratio and just make this a little bigger so we can see what's going on. I'm going to make it 500 pixels. Uh, everything else is fine, except for down here I have to say frame range, all frames, just so it renders everything. And if I hit Shift R, it's going to ask me, are you sure? Because I don't have anywhere that it's saved. That's fine. If I just click yes, it's going to start rendering. If I go back to the history here, it's going to render a kind of teeny version of, let me make that, uh, make this full size here so we can see it. It's going to make a, um, a, render of our scene as it is and we can look here and say do we like this do we like the placement of it all do we like the timing of it and this is a really good way without the shading without the shadowing which we haven't added yet it's just a nice way to kind of see and make sure now I can see right now that um, because we flipped to 16 by 9 I'm actually gonna undo this and go into our camera and because I flipped to 16 by 9 our ratio is way off so I, I actually need to pull out here and reveal more cubes and now I can do that render and now we're gonna see everything so sorry about that okay you can see now it's also rendering pretty quickly because we don't have shadowing on we have our auto light on and all these colors are just kind of again giving us a loose sense of timing of how this is all gonna play out so far this is looking right you can see we don't ever hit a hundred percent blue then the cubes start flipping back around Yep, and then they get to pink land, and then that those little middle ones are going to end up going to peach land, and that's exactly what we want. And also what we want to make sure is that is that there's still movement going on. We never want anything to stop moving. Everything has a fluid uh, kind of sense of motion to it. So there, this may be too dead of an end screen. We may have to add a little bit of animation, but let's look at it. One. Two. It's a little uh, it's a little quick there at the end. So some things as we look. The first move I like a lot. The second move it kind of stands still on me. You could see right when we go to this third move that right here, it kind of goes. Err! And once that peach is locked in, there's no movement. There's no sense of flow to it. Uh, everything up to there, I, I I think feels pretty good. So let's add a little bit more movement to the end before we kick out our render and get our shadowing and all of our passes and crap ready for After Effects. So uh, let's get out of there and let's just play with some keyframes. So um, one thing we could do is make sure that this, um, this third move doesn't quite get to its final resting place until later. And I'm just going to adjust the keyframes to make sure that happens. And now you can see there's still movement going on in those upper keyframes, so or in those upper cubes. So right there, ba 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 bam, and then flip. Greatness. One thing we can also do is um, uh, in our plane effector, we just we can go into our keyframes for our plane effector and kind of move them in. Because what I want is the plane effector to kind of be finished by the almost right on time with the with the end pink ones right there and that may even still be too much again we're just finessing what I'm doing now is just playing with how completed that pink area is on the end and what I kinda like is it really being slow about getting to its final place that feels good and then we're back I think there's much more sense of movement there. So let's do one more test render. Let's watch it go down. Again, you want your little test renders here to render as quick as possible just so you can get a sense of the final animation before we add all the texturing and really hog 
the the render speed we just want to get these out of the way and make sure we're on the right track before we add all the complicated crap so while we're rendering here I'm just gonna take a little sip of water hopefully you're enjoying enjoying this render beautiful all right I, th or I can already see that this is gonna be this is gonna be a lot better <clears throat> yeah see how it's not as complete that last this pink scene right here is not as complete as it used to be it used to kind of that but the last render we did it kind of locked into place but here I'm really feeling that there's still movement see that movement that sense of movements really gonna help and, and it may be hard to see because all these flat colors but you can see that just by adding a little bit more kind of um, variation at the end there we're gonna have still an, a sense of finish but a sense of that everything's still not a hundred percent complete and that's what I like animation wise I'm calling this a lock I'm digging it what we need to worry about now is just the shading which is the shadowing if we go back to the final render you can see they have this nice shading this nice shadowing that goes along um, all the animation you can see all the shadows and it's just really nice soft evenly lit shadowing and usually when you have that kind of flat overall nice smooth shadowing um, the the words uh, that go through your head should be uh, ambient occlusion and what ambient occlusion does is ambient occlusion looks at the surrounding area and if if um, if polygons are close to other polygons it puts a shadow and if there's no other polygons around it doesn't put a shadow um, let me just knock the accuracy down to 50% I'm gonna turn all these numbers down minimum samples 5 maximum samples I don't know 60 I'm just gonna make this low so we can render quickly and see what's going on you can see already that we have some shadowing going on and you can see from what I talked about whoop, let me do that again from what I talked about where there are um, polygons facing each other like here we have shadowing and where there's polygons that don't have any other faces around there is no shadowing and that's it that's all ambient occlusion does it looks at the distance between items and puts a shadow there if they're close and doesn't put a shadow there if they're far away um, that's it that's ambient occlusion so let me just pull this down maybe we can get a bigger render see what's going on and that's our look I mean that's essentially what's gonna shade all of our items we have nothing else to worry about um, so let's uh, tweak the settings and get that prepared net first of all we also don't need these colors um, so let's go into new materials just make a basic gray material and just add it on top of all of our other colors and uh, the only reason I'm doing that and not just deleting our colors is just in case we want to go back I want to make sure it's really easy to go back and forth between gray and our colors so again our colors we only needed just to kind of reference and now we're just worried about this look which is our shadowing now our shadowing is pretty splotchy pretty grainy that's because I knocked all the settings down so let's kind of um, get our samples going uh, our maximum samples what I uh, I've liked to do lately and this is based on um, some st uh, stuff that I heard from uh, some of the guys that worked at Maxon they uh, kind of mentioned some of these tips which is um, in some cases you want um, your accuracy to maybe stay a little bit lower but then turn up your maximum samples and this tends to give you um, kind of a cleaner result with a quicker render time doesn't always work they said um, but for certain things leaving the um, accuracy kind of in a middle ground and turning up your maximum samples allows the software to be a little bit more smart about um, where it's going and already we're getting a better uh, look here um, in fact I like this I like this a whole bunch I'm gonna tell you uh, I may turn it up just a tad more for our final render because we are gonna do a 16 or we're gonna do a full HD render so sometimes with larger HD um, larger uh, scenes we want to turn up those samples just a bit um, another thing to keep in mind before we set up our final render is uh, something that they do a little bit of and it, it only happens in some of these but I kinda like the effect I think it's that really slow one where I see it 
see if we can find it. It's the one with like the ocean and all that crap. I think it's maybe coming up. Yeah, you can see here, what they added here is see that kind of shimmering that's going across? See that little bit of like shimmer that floats across right there? What makes that is like a specular highlight. And before we get this to render, I'm just going to add a couple lights and add some specular highlights um, to get that shimmer. So let me set up a camera. There's our camera. Let's uh, move away from our camera. So I just set up a camera so we could go back to there without screwing around too much. Got the light. Let's pull the light out. And the light is going to go in two places. One is going to be way off to the right. And one, if I copy and paste, is going to go way off to the left. And what this is going to do is specular highlight. The specular highlight is going to look at the direction of the face based on the based on the lighting or based on the lights and then give it like a little bit of a uh, brightness to it. So if we go to um, our uh, our specular on our main material here, and we just kind of fatten out the, the width of our specular highlight, you can see what's going on is that specular is gonna be a lot more kind of uh, bright when it faces our lights, and it's gonna be a lot more normal when it faces uh, toward us. And in fact, if we just hit render, you can see these faces out here that are facing away, or toward the light a little bit more, are going to be brighter, and the ones that are facing directly toward us are going to be a little bit darker. And this is going to be a really subtle effect, but we're going to use it on top of our photos to give it a little bit more depth and a little bit more um, kind of, I don't know, effect, right? Uh, one last thing I, I did notice, check this out. We have, a, we have a cube here that's hanging out. We don't want this. We actually want our first frame to be 100% full color. We do not want that. So before we go any further, let's just head into our keyframes and just pull that first brightness down just by one. Just by one should be enough. That's it. It only took one degree or whatever this percent is. It's like one and a half percent and all of a sudden everything's there. So the shadowing actually showed us some pieces that we just didn't even know were there. So here's our animation. And then we flip back around, and here's about the final frame right there. Uh, this is where our logo is going to hang out right there. And again, we can't see it because of the no color, so we can just actually um, delete our gray uh, and turn our color back on just to see. Feeling good. All right, turn our gray uh, back on. Let's prepare this thing for render, for After Effects, and just get this thing going. Um, in our render settings, um, we have to set up a multi-pass render. Now, what the multi-pass render is going to do is give us a bunch of passes that we can then use to composite our scene in After Effects. The passes we need include an ambient occlusion pass, which is just the shadowing. So we could add all this fun shadowing to our photos. Because we don't want this on gray, we want this on our photos. So. We want a pass just for the ambient occlusion. We also want a pass for every one of these different face sides. So we have a pass, uh, if we turn our colors back on, we have a pass for the blue, we have a pass for pink, and green, and peach, right? And the way we set those up is we come into each face and we add a compositing tag for each one of our four faces, go to object buffer, and we enable buffer. And that's it. Uh, we do that for each one. Now, we need to enable a different buffer for each face. So let's go to face uh, four here. We're going to enable object buffer four for face four. Uh, face three, we're going to compositing. Face three, we're going to go enable buffer three. Th this doesn't matter. The numbers don't matter. We just need a different one for each face. I'm just doing this because, you know, makes sense to me. So we have four faces. We have four object buffers. And we have ambient occlusion. And don't forget, we also have that specular pass that we might want to use to add that little extra piece of gloss on our final render. So let's set that up. In our multi-pass settings, we need to come in and make a pass for each one of those things we just talked about. One, ambient occlusion. Next thing, specular. Next thing, object buffer. Now, when you click object buffer, 
It's going to ask, what group do you want? Now, we have four groups. So we have, there's one, object buffer. We have a second one, multipass, object buffer, three, multipass, object buffer, four. So let's, like, just double check here. In our multipass settings, we have ambient occlusion, specular, and four object buffers. One, two, three, and four. We need to turn on our multipass, right? Because we want it on. We want it to render. Then we go to our view. Oh, I'm sorry. Then we go to our output, and we make sure all of our uh, render settings are all set up, that our frames, we want all the frames, 250 frames is perfect. Uh, our width, instead of 500, we actually want 1280 which is going to go to 720 because we have uh, 16 by 9 on. We have a full HD video here. We have 1280 by 720. Um, then when we go to save, we need to save two things. One is our original render, which we may or may not use. Um, but if we come into, I have a, I already have a folder set up here. Um, and in renders, uh, I'm going to, no, in 3D, I'm actually going to uh, make a new folder called cube spin render 3. You could tell I've been playing around trying to get this look going for a while. I have, already have some renders in here. Um, and then in that, in that folder, I'm going to name, uh, this will be main cube render. Got it. Now, that's not all. We have to go down to multipass image. Make sure this is checked on. Save, right? Turn on multipass. Find a place for those to render. In this case, I'm just going to put them all in the same folder. I'm going to call this cube multi pass. Bam. And then it's going to name all these things. It'll be like cube multipass ambient occlusion, cube multipass whatever, right? It's going to take care of the rest of that. Everything else is fine. An 8 bit TIFF. It's cool with me. There is no alpha channel because it's full frame render. Last thing we want to do is use this compositing project file deal. We do want our After Effects file because we want to be able to, when this is done rendering, open into After Effects and let After Effects set up some of these layers. So I'm going to turn all this on. We really don't need a camera and all this stuff to come in. But by habit, I kind of flip all these switches because uh, some scenes you need it. We need an After Effects file. Uh, we need to uh, save the project file, so it's just going to go ahead and ask me what to name it. I could call it uh, cube comp one, and I'm just going to put like an underscore in front of it just so it pops up on top of our list, and that's it. We are ready to go, man. So uh, let's start our render and make sure everything's working the way we want it to before we kind of say goodbye for this tutorial and then um, get ready for the After Effects section. So you can see it start to render. So far, so good. Um, let's go into our layer browser. And this, uh, you may not be used to um, the uh, layer browser. This is new to, I think, 11.5, this picture viewer that has the ability to look at all your layers and to see all of your renders. Um, it just has a lot more flexibility. But if we hop into here, you're going to see we have our specular pass which is really light right now. You, you, we may be able to see this better when things start flipping. In fact, you can see this cube right there is starting to flip, starting to get a little bit brighter. It's exactly what we want in the specular pass. Perfect. Our background is kind of our general um, kind of coloring, right? Um, and in this case, it is actually coloring um, with our colors on. I actually left the colors on in this render. Uh, and that's really not too important because, again, we're not using the final render that we see to composite our final scene. All we're going to use is ambient occlusion, which here it is. Here's our shadowing, right? And then all of these object buffers. So you can see here's object buffer three, which is photo one, which is the first pink color. Then you can start to see these other object buffers pop in with some highlights. And these are what we're going to use to reveal our photos. Um, and we're going to, what we're going to use is we're going to use these as luma mats. So in fact, um, you know, part two of this tutorial will come out, uh, it might even be out, just check below. Uh, and if you um, get this file in After Effects, you can start to play around and use these as Luma mats. But let's talk more about that once we have this rendered. In part two of this tutorial, we're going to put all this thing together. So uh, feel free to watch this thing go. This is going to take a little bit. And, um, uh, you know, 
we're 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 getting there. We're we're bringing all these elements into After Effects. Um, in the next part here, we're gonna put all this together. We're gonna choose our photos and then flip between them, and we're gonna use uh, again these object buffers as luma mats to kind of create the rest of this. So, uh, stay tuned for part two. Uh, hope to see you guys there in part two of the tutorial. And again, I wanted to thank you. Um, for uh, sticking through this one is uh, maybe a little slow at first. I wanted to kind of spell a few things out. First of all, that you know there are many ways to uh, uh, to do this. Also, I wanted to share with you guys some of the um, sites that inspired me to kind of finish this thing up, including MoGraph.net, which kind of kicked me in the butt and said, "How in the heck are we going to do this?" Um. So uh, anyway, check those out. Um, good luck with your tutorial, and also I'll see you in. Part two, we're in After Effects. We're going to make this thing glossy. We're going to make this thing sexy. So uh, thanks for watching again, and uh, I'll see you in part two, guys. Hope you had a good one. Bye.